At the end of Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus was traveling around in Galilee, preaching, teaching, and healing. And so his reputation was growing. More people were becoming aware of Jesus, and so they were bringing their sick to have Jesus heal them. They wanted to hear Jesus' teaching. And so they traveled from all over to come and be with Jesus. They traveled from as far north as Syria, as far east as the Decapolis, as far south as Judea, and they came to Jesus. And they were kind of like groupies who just followed Jesus wherever he went. And so if you're there, let's read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus saw the crowds, and he realized it was an opportunity. So he went up on the hillside, and he sat down, because that was the typical form of teaching back then. The teacher would sit down, And the students or the listeners or uh, those who wanted to hear what he had to say would gather around him. And it says here that it was the disciples who gathered around and he began to teach them. So understand that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching primarily to believers. The disciples had already committed to following Jesus. They were always com- already committed to going where Jesus went. So they were followers of Christ, and the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching his followers. It's just that the crowds were there and were able to listen in. And I, I want us just, before we dig into the first two Beatitudes, which is all we're going to get a chance to look at tonight, I just want to, us to notice some, some commonalities in all of the Beatitudes. For instance, you'll notice that all of the Beatitudes follow the same form. They start with, blessed are, and then there's a condition, and then the promise. All of the Beatitudes are talking about the inner person. Now, they might point to actions or expect actions, but all of those actions come from the inner thoughts, the inner attitudes, the inner commitments of the person. And the Beatitudes are not evangelistic. Jesus is not saying here, if you want to get saved, you need to become poor in spirit. He's not saying, if you want to get saved, you need to mourn. He's not saying, if you want to get saved, then you need to become meek. The Beatitudes are not evangelistic, but they are, big word, eschatological, which means they just point to the second coming of Jesus. Because what the Beatitudes do is they say, because you are this, because you are this, because you are this, when Jesus comes again, you will, you will, you will. And all of the Beatitudes begin with this word, blessed or blessed. It means happy. It means joyful. It means an internal state of being blessed. It means spiritually prosperous. And notice that this is a declaration of Jesus. He declares that those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, are blessed. It is a covenant word. It is a word that is centered in a relationship with God. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God told his people, if you will obey the covenant, you will be blessed. If you don't obey the covenant, you will be cursed. In the first chapter of James, James writes and he says, those who remain faithful coming through difficulties and trials, are blessed. The book of Revelation says, 
those who have washed their robes in the blood of Jesus Christ are blessed. And this is God basically saying, congratulations, my child. Because you are poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Congratulations, my child. Because you mourn, you will be comforted. So, Jesus starts out here and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean by that? God is saying, congratulations for being poor in spirit. Believers, those of us in Christ, must be poor in spirit. But what does it mean to be poor in spirit? The New Testament has a couple of different words when it's talking about poverty. One of the words is used to describe somebody who is poor and just barely getting by. It's a word that is used in the New Testament for a day laborer. Somebody who goes out and works all day, and then they get paid a day's wage so that they can feed themselves and their family for that day. They don't have anything extra. They're just making it, but they're just getting by. The New Testament has another word for poverty, and th that word means extreme poverty, severe poverty. It is used to describe a person who would not be alive, who would not be able to survive were it not for the kindness of others. It's the word that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 16 in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus where Lazarus is begging at the rich man's gate. It is a severe, extreme poverty. And that's the word that Jesus uses. I remember my first experience in witnessing that kind of poverty. I was probably in the ninth or 10th grade and I was on the Bible Bowl team at our church and we traveled out to the North American Christian Convention in Denver. And one day, a good buddy of mine and myself, we decided that we would go to Charlie Brown's for dinner. Now, if you're not familiar, Charlie Brown's is kind of a famous restaurant in the Denver area. And so we went and we had dinner, and we were walking back to our hotel, and we were walking through this part of downtown Denver where there was a lot of foot traffic and sidewalk cafes and so forth. And I, I looked down this alley, and I saw a homeless man. And he was picking through the trash bins behind the restaurants looking for food. And he was digging through the trash and he was finding the scraps from those restaurants in the trash and eating it. Now I knew about food pantries. I knew about soup kitchens. But that was the first time I had ever seen somebody eating out of the trash. And that's the kind of poverty Jesus is referring to. But he's not talking about uh, monetary poverty. He's not talking about being short of money. He's talking about spiritual poverty. He says it's being poor in the spirit. And the poor in spirit are those who have an internal awareness of their spiritual need. That they are spiritually destitute. Someone said that being poor in spirit is the opposite of being rich in pride. It is having this deep down internal awareness of our sinfulness. That even though we are in Christ, we have within us a sinful nature that is still alive and still active and still working hard to influence us. And so we are in desperate need of God and His grace. The truth is that I think that there are a lot of Christians who just don't think they're too bad. I think there are a lot of people who think, well, yeah, I committed some sins, and I need Jesus for that, but overall, I'm a pretty good person. I think there's a lot of Christians who think, you know what? I've been a Christian for many years, and I'm a lot better than I was. And so I don't think there's much bad left in me. 
Jesus is saying here that believers must not think like that. Instead, true believers should have a continual awareness. In fact, a growing awareness of our sinfulness, of the sinful nature within us and how strong it is and how effective it can be in our lives. And so we have to have this desperate desire and awareness of God and His grace. Months ago, I saw on Twitter, uh, Matt Smethurst said this. He's talking about the Apostle Paul and how the Apostle Paul identified himself. Apostle Paul said in A.D. 55, in 1 Corinthians 15, in A.D. 55, Paul said, I am the least of all the apostles. Then five years later, in A.D. 60, in the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, he said, I am the least of all the saints. And two years after that, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said, I am the least of all sinners. Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul, the longer he was in Christ, the more aware he was of his battle with his sinful nature and how desperately he needed Jesus. See, this is the weird position of the Christian. We know that we're forgiven, that we're saved. We know that we have been made holy. We know that the Holy Spirit is in us, working in us to sanctify us, to purify us, to make us more like Christ. But we also have to have the awareness of how desperate we are. How desperate we are and how subject we can be to sin and the pull of sin. And that awareness is what it means to be poor in spirit. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, has a present and a future sense. And what Jesus says here is that those who are poor in spirit are right now experiencing the present kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus comes again, they will experience the future sense of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. The, the present kingdom is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is ruler in our hearts. And so we are his slaves. We are his subjects. We are his servants. But it also means that we are a child of God. So when you are broken over your sinfulness, when you are crushed because of the continuing battle you feel with your sinful nature, when you are desperate in your need for God's grace, know that you are where you're supposed to be. You are in the kingdom. You are in the kingdom. Well, then Jesus goes on and he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Again, Jesus is saying, Congratulations to my children because you mourn. What does it mean? To mourn. Well, this word means to be continually grieving, constantly mourning. Uh, it means to be uh, grieving and mourning at such a depth that you can't hide it. Mark uses this word to describe the grief and the tears and the mourning of Christ's followers while he was crucified on the cross. Sometimes you can hide your tears. Sometimes you can mask your feelings. But what Jesus is talking about here is such a, a brokenness when we do commit sin that we can't hide it. We can't hide it. And again, Jesus is referring to mourning over our sin. Uh, poverty of spirit means 
that we are grieving over our sinful nature, our sinfulness. Mourning means that we are broken and grieving over the sins that we then commit. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says that we can either mourn now or we can mourn later. He says that if we grieve and mourn over our sins now, that when Jesus comes again, we can laugh and be joyful. But he says, if we laugh and uh, make light of our sins now, when Jesus comes again, we will grieve and mourn. James chapter 4 says this, Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Some Christians have misunderstood what Jesus is saying in these Beatitudes. Some have misunderstood what these verses in James mean. The Christian faith is a joyful faith. The Christian faith is a joyful faith. In fact, I believe, I believe that one of the sounds that should be most frequent in the house of God is laughter. I think we should be hearing laughter in the church often, even in worship services. We should be laughing. But that doesn't mean that we aren't broken over our sin, that we don't mourn when we are guilty of sin, it doesn't mean that we make light of that at all. But rather, it means that gloom and doom is not a characteristic of a Christian. But mourning over sin is a characteristic of a Christian. Now, he says here, let's go back. He talks about grieving, mourning, and wailing. The idea of grieving here in James means that we are devastated. We're devastated when we fall into sin. We don't take it lightly. We don't, don't just pass over it, but we are devastated by our own sin. That word mourn, it's the word mourn that we find here in this beatitude. It means that, that our grief is so deep that we can't hide it. And the word there for wail refers to a funeral lament. And so for those of us who are in Christ, when we do sin, we should be crushed by that, and we should feel the grief over that at such a depth that the only way we can respond is sobs, weeping, moaning, and wailing. There was a deacon one Sunday at the conclusion of the worship service who went up to this little old country preacher, and he, he said to him, he said, during the worship service, there was a woman in our congregation who got the joy of the Lord. And that was kind of their code for she got saved. And this little wise old country preacher said, he said, that's great, but did she ever get any sorrow? <laughs> because he understood you have to mourn over your sin before you can experience the joy of the Lord. Now, Jesus says here, congratulations, those of you who mourn. And he says, for they will be comforted they will be comforted. If we mourn over our sins, we can be comforted in knowing that our sins are forgiven. Jesus died for our sins. He dealt with our sins. Those sins are forgiven. We can also be comforted in knowing that the power of sin has been broken. The Holy Spirit indwells us so that we have the power to resist temptation. And we can take comfort in knowing that someday sin and all of its effects will be removed for the believer. Uh, Thomas Hooker was a Puritan preacher and theologian. And uh, many even give him credit for constitutional liberty such as we enjoy here in the United States. So he was a man of many accomplishments, and he was on his deathbed. And many people from his church came to visit him on his deathbed. And while they were gathered around, they were talking among themselves, and there were some of those believers who were saying to him, you know, you've lived such a pious life. 
you've accomplished so many things that maybe it's not really the Lord's time for you to go and claim your rewards. And Hooker, Hooker who knew the Bible, Hooker who knew his theology said, when I go, I don't go to claim rewards. I go to claim mercy. I go to claim mercy. And that's what it means to be poor in spirit and to mourn that our only hope, our only security, our only assurance is Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for us. So, does that describe you, O oh believer? Or is your confidence before Christ that you're not really that bad? Or that you've progressed so far? Or do you bow in the presence of God, humbled by your continuing struggle with sin? And is your joy in the Spirit balanced by mourning over the sins you commit. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, or they will be comforted. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for these words from Jesus, these declarations by Jesus. Congratulations to those of us who are in Christ, who are poor in spirit, and who mourn. For we will be blessed. We are blessed. So Father, I pray that for those of us who are in Christ, we would understand. We would understand what it is to be poor in spirit and to mourn. For the, somebody who's here maybe this evening and who doesn't know Jesus, Father, that, that they too are experiencing conviction over their sin and their need for Jesus. That they are desperate for a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray.